but <laughs> you can see. So this is a little American alligator. It's not a crocodile. Okay, here we go. Here's a couple more. In fact, one of them just flew. Port Royal Sound is a marriage of ocean and land, a relationship created by a combination of rising sea level, extremely high tides, and unique geology. This ecosystem was created when rising sea levels submerged valleys along the coast. The result is Port Royal Sound, a marine habitat that extends inland for over 20 miles. Since our tides average eight and a half feet and we get minimal freshwater inflow, our salinity is influenced by tidal waters from the ocean, not freshwater from the uplands. Massive oyster rakes colonize our flats. These shellfish reefs filter our waters and provide a safe place for marine creatures to feed and hide. Spartina grass is the basis of our marine food web. As the grass decays, the waters become turbid with detritus giving the smallest marine organisms a rich source of nutrients. These plankton provide plenty of food for crabs, shrimp, and a high diversity of fish species. Join us as we explore Port Royal Sound, one of North America's overlooked ecological jewels. is home to an incredible diversity of bird species, but the oyster catcher has to be about the most charismatic of all. Their bright orange bills, their black and white dapper coloration, and their comical movements make them favorites for most naturalists. Well, we've got a real treat today. We have Dr. Al Seegers with us, and Al has okay. agreed to let us participate in an oyster catcher survey. So Al, why do we want to study oyster catchers? Well, Tony, you said they're great birds and, and studies have shown us that the population has really crashed, about 90% population decline. So we're working with actually a crew in a plane and they're actually spotting these birds from the plane and because they can cover a lot more ground, they can do the whole state. We're basically going to verify and ground truth what they're seeing in the air. So amazing birds, uh, really struggling in terms of habitat. And so we're going to go see what we can find today. Sounds great. Good. Let's go. Al, here's some dolphins. Yeah, I'm glad you said dolphins and not porpoises, Tony. There's kind of a misconception. We have bottlenose dolphins here in South Carolina. Amazing animals. You know, very often they'll trail along behind a boat. Uh, some of these guys might actually be looking for handouts. One of the problems we have is dolphin feeding. And again, that's kind of a dangerous place for them to be around a boat propeller. And we're seeing more and more boat strikes. So certainly we want to discourage, not only discourage, but it's illegal to feed these animals. And people often wonder why, and then it, it puts them in the most dangerous place in the world. And, and, and we're seeing more boat strikes as people, out of ignorance more so than intent, um, feed these animals. Yeah, people think they're doing the animals a favor when in, when in reality they're hurting them. Oh yeah, they're just training them to come to the most dangerous place in their life. But amazing animals, and uh, again, they're very curious. Oh, we got a, looks like a pair of oyster catchers right here. So how do you want to do this? Here we do. Well, we don't want to spook them. So what we're going to do is just kind of come around a little further up. So we're going to kind of sneak up behind We're going to sneak up, <laughs> uh, stay far enough away where we really don't disturb the birds. They're very tolerant, but you can get too close. So we're okay. going to, we're going to yeah, err on the side of stuff. caution. Yeah. Okay, we found a nice pair of birds. First question I have, why are they paired up at this point? Uh, they're territorial. So when they set up their nesting range, as they're just starting to do now, they're going to stake out some turf and they're going to defend it against other oyster so catchers. So this is a male and a female and they pick their Two spot. adult birds. Look through the scope and you can see that bright orange bill. And it's really unique in the adult birds. And they reach breeding age probably four to five years of age. The young birds actually have darkish tips to their bill, kind of a gray charcoal color on the distal kind of tip of their bill. So these are definitely two adult birds. 
again, getting ready to set up breeding territory for uh, nesting this summer. And it's not really their favorite habitat. Normally they like to nest on the beach, but uh, there's another species that likes to go to the beach too, us. And so they really lost a lot of their natural nesting habitat, which is one of the reasons their population's in decline. So they come up on shell rakes like this and are prone to overwash. Well, we, and especially at high tide, there's not a lot of real estate here, oh, no, is there? No, and so you get a great big high tide sail, a full moon, it's a windy day, a big boat comes by, washes the nest away. So we've really impacted these birds by taking their, their nesting habitat so away. So what is the nest going to look like? Once these, so first of all, when are these guys going to build their nest and what is it going to look like? Uh, they aren't very good home builders. They just kind of scrape out a little depression in the shell and will lay their eggs in there and they pretty much guard it. They stay with it. One bird will go feed, take turns guarding the nest. But there's no real structure. It's really more just a scrape. Than and of a course, nest. there's a lot of predators that eat oyster catcher. Eggs. Yeah, minks, uh, raccoons, certainly on the beaches where they nest, uh, dogs, uh, feral cats. Uh, we've impacted them in lots of ways as far as uh, the habitat, especially with their nesting. So obviously, these guys eat oysters. How do they do it? Amazing. Uh, you and I have stabbed ourselves in the hand with an oyster knife more times than we want to tell people. But these guys actually, when the oyster's cracked, it's partially out of the water, these birds walk, stick their bill down, cut the adductor muscle that closes the shell before the oyster can close. That's pretty slick. It's pretty quick. And the learning curve needs to be fast. So you've got to learn how to do it. I actually had the chance to watch a pair of adults teach a chick how to feed. And they would go over and they'd go in, cut the muscle, pull the oyster out, hold their oyster up and shake it and make the chicks run over. Then they stick the oyster back in the shell and make the chicks take it out of the shell over and over and over again. So just a miracle of nature, how all this works. I noticed there's a couple other birds around. It looks like there's some ruddy turnstones. Yep. Uh, kind of mucking around and turning over little pieces of oyster and such. Here's some more coming. Here two oh, birds flying in now. Guys. Hopefully they You can hear them there. talking. So as the tide oh. comes in, Tony, and the oysters go under water, uh, there's nothing for them to eat. So they're going to use this as a rest area. So not only are these shell rakes important from a, a nesting standpoint, but this is where they're going to come rest between tide cycles. Again, they eat oysters. When the oysters are underwater, they can't get to them. So this is kind of the lounge between, between low tides. So what's, what's going on here? Yeah, I think we're having a little turf war here. Uh, we, we've had some a pair of birds that are trying to set up shop here and with these other birds have come in on them. So they're having a little territorial display. Coastal real estate's pretty important. It, it gets more, and it gets more expensive every day. It really <laughs> does. Well, I'll tell you, there, there are so many charismatic things oh, to my. these. They're beautifully colored. They uh, have great voices. They're very interactive. They're, they're fun to watch, for if, sure. If you had to love a bird, this would be one at the top of the list because they're yeah. great birds, really great birds. Conditions are perfect today. It's overcast, it is steamy, I mean, it's sticky out here. And most importantly, it rained last night. And that means it's a good time to look for one of the only reptiles that spends its entire life in and around the salt marsh. So what I thought we'd do is just kind of look around and see what we can find. Okay, we got in a little bit of a rainstorm, but that's made it even more humid. And we walked right up on this, this little female. And she's, I can't tell if she's already nested and she's heading back into the marsh, or if she maybe is heading someplace to nest. But this is a diamondback terrapin, adult female, I can tell by size. And also it's got a huge head. Females get a much bigger head than the males. Uh, and females eat different foods. They eat things like periwinkle snails and bigger crabs. Whereas the males with the smaller bodies and smaller heads have to eat smaller things. Beautiful diamond sort of pattern. Now these are extremely variable. They can be kind of dull green or they can be very ornately patterned. This is one that I would say is a little bit more dull than most. But I'm gonna, <laughs> looks like I've caused her to make a little bit of a detour, but maybe she's already nested and she's heading back into the marsh. There's sea oxide daisy behind us and the marsh is just around the corner. Okay, here's another one. This one, 
You know, this one is headed away from the marsh. I'm gonna pull her out just so we can see her. Oh, much prettier turtle too. This is another big female. And this one is moving actually in the opposite direction as the other one. This is moving out of the marsh. I'll bet it's going up in here to nest. They like sunny spots, kind of open grassy areas, uh, but usually on the edge of, uh, close to the marsh, but usually on the edge of a thicket like this. Boy, they are neat animals. And this is about as big as they get. It's important to realize that this same female has been nesting in this same area for decades. These guys have a tendency to stay in one general area. And it's crossed roads, it's avoided raccoons and other predators. We know for a fact that this species can live 50 or 60 years, and maybe more than that. Just, just an incredible, incredible animal. So this female is gonna lay eggs here. The eggs are gonna hatch in about two months or so, actually probably 70, 70 days or so. But then the babies are gonna overwinter in the nest. They're gonna stay in that nest until next spring. And so the little babies don't emerge until after they go through an entire winter underground. When they start out, they are little guys, little tiny things. And it takes them probably 15 years or more to reach adult size. It's not that often that you get to see turtles like this. They're obviously a bunch moving today. We timed it perfectly. But I'll tell you what, let's take a look at where these animals spend most of their lives. Here in the salt marsh, they go in and out with the tides. There's plenty of small crabs and periwinkle snails and things to eat. This is a great place for a terrapin to live. But let's go see if we can catch one. So what we gotta do first is look for heads. So terrapins will stick just their little heads up out of the water. Then we're gonna take this cast net and we're gonna throw it where, the, well the turtle will probably go down before we get there, but even if it does, we'll throw the cast net and see if we can catch it. Landed right on top of where he was, but let's see if he moved. Yeah, we got one. Yeah, a little male. So this is a much smaller male terrapin, and also look how small the head is. Very tiny head, kind of a, not as tall a turtle as the females as well. And they just don't get nearly as big. This is a full-size adult male. You can see where it gets its name from these beautiful sort of diamond patterns. One of the other things to look at is look at these big paddles for back feet. These guys are aquatic. They spend the majority of their lives in the water, in, in salt water or brackish water. And they have to swim in and out with the tides every day. And so they've got to have some pretty strong legs and some pretty good paddles to move themselves through the water. Now, since this is one of our study sites, we want to get some information from this animal. So I'm going to give him a little dip in the water, get him good and wet. And the first thing I want to do is measure him. So carapace length, and the carapace is the top part of the shell. So I'm going to take a quick measurement, and it looks like he's 13.1. So 131 millimeters. So we jot those down. And then what we want to do is we want to be able to individually mark this animal. We want to know who it is. So the way we mark turtles is we give each one of them an alphabet code. And this one is supposed to be A, B, J. So each one of these scoots represents a letter of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, all the way around. So the way to do that is to use a file. Okay, this will leave, this won't hurt the turtle, but it will leave a permanent mark. So I know who it is next time I catch it. Because I think there's a good chance that we'll catch this terrapin again. Terrapins are not here in the numbers that they once were. So we need to learn all we possibly can about them so we can do the best job of taking care of them. 
About this time of year, a lot of boats show up in the Broad River, and they're after one of the most exciting fish that occurs anywhere, and that's the cobia. Our deep saline waters are an ideal place for cobia to spawn. So we are going to take an adventure today with Captain Christopher Manson, Manson Charter Services, and Chris is going to take us on an adventure to catch a cobia. We're going to try it, Tony. So how are we going to do this, Chris? What, well, what are Tony, we going to do? Well, you know, Tony, we just got set up. We've got our, our anchor down. We've got the chum bag on the bottom. We've got our rods out. Um, soon we're going to start trying to catch a little bit more bait, try to catch some greenies or whatever else might be around. There's a small strip of live bottom, and uh, that's, that's pretty much the only live bottom that we have here is these little breaks from the current, and that's where these fish will migrate. Well, this is really exciting. I mean, Kobe are neat fish, and I hope we get a chance to see one. Absolutely. Me too. I'm using something called a sabiki rig, and we're trying to catch what are called greenies, thread fin herring, and they're down in deep water like this, and they're excellent bait for cobia. So what I'm doing is just kind of jigging this sabiki rig off the bottom and seeing if I can get something. This can be a really, really productive way to catch bait. Yep. Looks like three on this one. Excellent and maybe these are catch a cobia for it. All right, we got something. He's going under the boat. I, it looked, came up the surface. It looked like it might've been a cobia, but it, I'm, <laughs> oh man. Nice pull there. Oh, it is a cobia. Oh, easy on them now. What a great looking animal this is. All right, Chris, I'm gonna see if I can get him up a little bit closer. Every time we get him close, he just kinda makes a run for it. One shake, shake of that head will there go. Can pop everything loose. Boy, this fish does not seem to tire out, tire out very quickly. I mean, there's a lot of current here, and he's still. There you go. Ease the tension off. Get this rod out of the way. Beautiful fish. It really is. So how big do these fish have to be? We're going to let this one go, but how big do these have to be so that you can keep them? Tony, they've got to be 33 inches to the fork. Right. And the fork of the tail is right here. One of the things we're going to do is we want to get a DNA sample from this fish. So I'm going to cut a little bit of a clip off the anal fin and we can take this sample to Waddell Mariculture Center and they can tell us a little bit about where this fish came from. Could be this fish was actually spawned at Waddell Mariculture Center and released into these waters, or it could be it came from somewhere else. Because one of the things we want to do is learn all we can about these fish so that we can protect them for the future. Right, Chris? I mean, That's we right. want to catch these for years to come, don't we? Absolutely. Let's dunk this one back in the water for a second, Tony, and then we'll go over a few more okay. points about that. So let's take a quick look at this fish and a couple things you notice. One is they have a row of spines that are right here that are just absolutely impressive. And you can see they're very much like nails. But Chris, show them the, show them the spines. That's the spines you got to worry about. And I didn't even realize this exist <laughs> until Chris pushed on that. That is unbelievable. I and mean, Tony, they are full metal. I mean, I mean, just solid bone. Feel them. Razor, there's, razor sharp. And there's, you can only go up to 90 degrees and they lock in the place. That's just incredible. Now they're built like a torpedo, aren't they? I mean, they're fast and they're muscular. They are. So these fish come here to spawn, right? That's correct. And uh, our conditions are perfect. There's great food, things like crabs that they need for egg production, uh, and lots of fish. There's gotcha. threadfin herring. Uh, what else they um, I get a lot of sea robins. They eat a lot of sea robins. Um, this, this animal epitomizes Port Royal Sound to me. I mean, it comes here. This is a very special place. Uh, because it's so deep and because the water is so salty here, it just, this is the animal that epitomizes what Port Royal Sound is all about. Absolutely. Right now we're 12 miles inshore, and that is just unheard of for, for cobia. Okay, well, we don't want to hurt this fish. We want to release it. Absolutely. So let's get it back in and let it go. When you're resuscitating them, you like to, to have them in the water with their face facing into the current. 
and you don't let them go until they start to fight you. So we want to make sure we revive this one, make sure it's ready to go. And... <laughs> it's especially important when you're releasing tarpon as well, Tony, that you resuscitate them to the point where they're actually fighting to get out of your hand. Good. Yeah, we want this fish to do, to do well. Starting to fight a little bit. Oh yeah, she's about ready. I'll drop down. All right, good deal. I'm not sure there's definitely something on it. I'm not sure. Oh, there we go. What do you have there, Tony? I can't tell. <laughs> Man, this feels good, whatever it is. It's about to come over the surface. Yeah. Oh! There you go. This is a nice fish. So it looks like <laughs> this may take a while. These are amazingly strong fish. They pull hard. They, they just are very, very impressive. They're solid muscle. And of course, there's all the current here too, which they use to their advantage. But this is a nice big fish. I think he's coming in a little bit closer, Chris. Well, <laughs> we're not there yet, are we? Oh! Boy, that was a good run. Just dove straight down. Yeah, this is far from over. Just make sure you don't grab that line. Okay. This is a strong <laughs> fish. Oh man. Yeah. Every time I feel like I'm getting this fish in, it runs about 20 yards of line out. So, I mean, I'm certainly no professional fisherman, but this is a strong fish. Guys, I hate to be kind of a wimp, <laughs> but I'm gonna pass this off to the professional fisherman for a minute. And uh, Chris is gonna see if he can make a little headway on this. This is a big fish, and I'm kind of getting tired. Okay, go. Chris. You can feel on this line, Tony. There she is, right here behind the boat. See her? You can feel the abrasion of the line from having get, been pulled off so many times already. You so, know. Chris, don't make this look too easy. Oh! <laughs> All right, I'm gonna switch with you. And bottom lip. Now close it. Ready? One, yeah. two, two, three. <clears throat> okay, so this is a big, big fish, Chris. So this is a big female. And a female like this. She's 42. And a female, 42 pounds. So this is a big cobia. And it's still very, very green. I mean, that was a long fight, but this fish still has a lot of energy. A big female like this can lay a million eggs. She can spawn twice, two million eggs in, in one, one year, year from a fish like this. These fish can reach 15 pounds in a single year. So they, they grow extremely quickly. Uh, the other thing that's really important, Chris, these, these are our fish, right? These are fish that move from offshore to here. That's just correct. East, that's east correct. to west and west to east. And they're not coming north or south or anything like that. There are fish that move in every year. You know, everybody thinks I'm going to get this fish because of the Florida guys are going to get it or the Georgia guys are going to get it or, and it's not true. You know, almost all these fish, their actual migrational pattern is east to west. And the big ones are females, right? A lot, most of the big ones are females. Um, they've got a little bit of a broader head, typically, and a lot more of a swollen admin. Uh, we're going to let this one go anyway. This one could be full of eggs. I'm staying away from those, those spines. But let's go ahead and get this one back in the water. Absolutely. We're going to make sure we resuscitate her, even though she's totally lively. We want to make sure that she's 100% or as close as we can get to 100% before we let her go. She looks good. Right? <laughs> she's definitely she doing like good. She's coming right back. I'm going to let her go. You just let her go whenever you're ready. She's on her way. <laughs> good job, Tony. That was Wonderful incredible. Wonderful fight. Thank you so much for letting us join you today. Thank you for having me, Tony. I'll tell you what, Port Royal Sound is an amazing fishery, isn't it? It really is. Huge diversity of life. These kids from Whale Branch Middle School are building their very own oyster rake. They bag the oysters, they're working with South Carolina DNR with the SCORE program, and they're going to place these bags out in the marsh and make an oyster reef. This is Tyre Harris. Tyre is a student at Whale Branch Middle School. Tyra, you having a good time? Yes. 
So what do you think is going to live here? What kind of animals are going to live uh, in this region? I think all types of crabs, more fish, and worms, and some larger fish to eat those fish. That's right. So this is kind of a nursery for animals that live in the open ocean, isn't it? Yes. So reefs like this are important for water quality too, right? Well, one oyster can filter up to two gallons of water per hour, so that helps the water clarity. Absolutely. And, clarity. and you multiply that times the number of oysters that are out here, and we're talking about a lot of water filtering, right? Yes. So what you're doing is important for the whole ecosystem, not just right here, and not just for your school. Looks like they're just about finished putting these recycled oyster shells back in the marsh. It won't be long until new oysters take root, and this becomes a reef that is loaded with life. Thanks for joining us on Coastal Kingdom.